what made you so special. So, if you're watching this, then you've no doubt heard about Nando V movies and fellow YouTubers One Marvelous Scene. And if you haven't, well, a bunch of YouTube essayists are compiling a list of our favorite scenes within the MCU in an anticipation for Endgame. And after you're done watching this video, go check out the playlist below. Anyway, naturally, as someone pretty new, I feel a need and desire to contribute my own voice to the matter with my favorite scene from Captain America, The First Avenger. The specific scene being the origin of Captain America's famous line. I chose this scene not only for its brilliance in introducing Steve Rogers to the audience, but also as a great example in character building. You see, Steve's line is more than just a good retort. This line is what we understand as his character's thesis statement. Something that, no matter how much might change or alter about the character, this one principal value will always remain true. A character's thesis is not unlike an essay's thesis. While an essay attempts to prove a central point to the reader with cited sources and examples, a character's thesis shows off their personality and goals based on how they react to the plot and conflict of the story they exist in. And it's a very difficult task to create a thesis, especially in a superhero story. How does a writer differentiate an individual's sense of heroism from one another without making them sound the same? If the thesis is too broad and simple, then the character will appear flat and generic with a thesis statement like, I want to do good things. That doesn't mean anything. I mean, don't we all want to do what's best? But if they narrow down too much, then they run the risk of also alienating and trapping a character within a hole that they have no room to write any nuance for, like, uh, uh, some random example off the top of my head, uh, You can't stop that. I am Thor, son of Odin. Because how would that inform Thor's character in more mundane scenes other than that he's a god? But I'm getting off track. My point is that writing a deliberate character thesis is a monumental task. It involves having to know who that character truly is. Concrete enough to remain true, yet flexible enough to allow for nuance. It's a technique that I'd advise writers to utilize, especially for your protagonists. And I'd even nudge my players from a D&D game to think about when crafting their player characters. But now that we've cleared that up, let's get into the scene. Every able-bodied young man is lining up to serve his country. The scene begins with a clip of World War II propaganda taking up the whole frame with an announcer detailing the war effort. But the clip eventually pans over to Steve as the announcer reads off. Every able-bodied young man is lining up to serve his country. A subtle jab at Steve because rather than joining the war effort, he is in a theater watching a movie. Nonetheless, he is engrossed with the film. Until it cuts to the line. Even little Timmy is doing his part. Collecting scrap metal. And now Steve looks a bit more solemn and ashamed, a fact that's alluded to a bit later. What do you do? Collect scrap metal yes. in my little red wagon? It is here when we get the crude interruption of the heckler in the film. Who cares? Quick cuts between the different people in the theater and Steve show how attention grabbing the heckler is. Even within the shots, people are turning to look at the heckler. The discomfort on their face is quite obvious, yet no one is saying anything. Except for Steve. Hey, you wanna show some respect? His voice is hushed, yet pointed. Steve is not picking a fight, he's trying to keep calm and appeal to the better nature of the heckler. And there is a solid beat of silence that on your first viewing you might even think the heckler might be done. As the announcer's narration begins to get louder as the propaganda is in full effect, bandage and wounded soldiers march across the screen displaying the patriotic pride of dying for your freedom and country. Then the camera holds on a woman in the theater. Her eyes begin to tear up, insinuating that she lost someone to the war effort. So even if the propaganda isn't working on the audience, the usage of someone in the cinema shows how the war is still impacted on the common civilian, tugging at our heartstrings. But the heckler barks out again, Let's go. Get on with it. this time causing the woman to close her eyes again in an attempt to block out the heckler. People are turning around again and almost lost amongst the cruelness of this heckler, or just a simple usage of bystander syndrome. But of course, Steve isn't having any of it. Cartoon. Hey, you wanna shut up? This time loudly scolding the heckler, and notice the line changes from appealing to the heckler's better nature, but instead shutting down his toxic behavior. The heckler stands up, his towering figure coincidentally played at the same time as the announcer reads the line. Together with allied forces, we'll face any threat. And it cuts back to Steve, who does not look very confident in this confrontation. 
His face falls and he attempts to make himself look bigger. In a brilliant scene transition, Steve is getting punched by the heckler. He crashes down onto the garbage cans, which I don't think I have to explain the meaning, but he gets back up, only to be punched down to the trash for a second time. And this third time, he gets up holding the cutest bit of foreshadowing with a garbage can lid as his shield. And once again, the seat holds for a minute to allow the audience to acknowledge and hope for his success, but instead he is beat for the third time. This is less of a fight and more of just a beating, because the heckler is clearly overpowering Steve and it's taking him everything he has just to get back up again. But it's this next time he stands. Steve groans and gasps, his pain and exhaustion is clear as day. It cuts back to the heckler who taunts Steve. You just don't know when to give up, do you? And Steve harshly, weakly, yet adamantly calls out the line. His line. I'm like this all day. For the first time in the fight, he charges forward with a punch, but is quickly parried and knocked back into the trash cans. Then Bucky shows up and kicks him away because, you know, whatever. But this one scene, this one and a half minute clip, tells you everything you need to know about Steve Rogers. And it culminates in his line, I can do this all day, because that is his character thesis. This is his purpose. This is why he will become Captain America. What made you so special? Nothing. I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. Steve is an empathetic person. This is why he feels bad about not being able to join the war effort. And seeing others in despair while lost in his own powerlessness only makes him feel worse. Yet nonetheless, it doesn't make him compensate. I got no right to do any less than them. That's what you don't understand. Like many of us watching, he is in admiration of the heroism on screen. So when the heckler first interrupts, he doesn't immediately pick a fight. He tries to get the heckler to see what he does, a last-ditch effort to see if there is some good in this person. But the heckler goes off again, clearly hurting others around him, specifically someone who lost somebody and during one of the more heartfelt moments of the segment. Steve can see that this heckler is a toxic person, so he switches gears to shut him down, rather than try to appease him. He has given the heckler a chance, but he didn't take it, and this type of behavior is what Steve is truly against. This ignorant and cruel behavior. The fight happening in Steve's face prior say a lot, especially in tandem with his thesis. Steve is not dumb, he was not expecting to win this fight, because it doesn't matter whether or not what he's attempting to do is practical. Steve knows right from wrong, and trying to shut it down is all that matters, Saying something and standing up against evil, even if the consequences are dire, actually, you know, especially if the consequences are drastic and he won't win, it doesn't matter. He will call it out when he sees it. While still impressive, the line is less about his physical strength, but instead about his ideological willpower. The statement namely begins with I, saying that this is a personal belief and fortitude. Something is internalized within him a moral standard that only he holds himself to. Bucky and Peggy both question Steve on his recklessness, but he shakes it off, never in an arrogant manner like some of his fellow heroes, but in a stagnant and almost comfortable manner that implies that this is just who he is. Did you have something against running away? You stand up, you push back. You can't say no forever, right? He could falter on these beliefs and it'd still be totally understandable. No one would think any less of him. So in a way, this thesis also showcases his biggest fault, his stubborn determination, and his greatest strength, his unyielding willpower. Not only in the protection of the people around him, not only against evil, and not only for the moral standard he holds himself to, but all of it. Accomplishing all of this from one line elevates him from just being the standard good-natured hero. This is Steve Rogers. This is what allowed the super soldier experiment to work on him despite the painful process. This is why he leads the Avengers, a team made up of an ego, a hulk, and a god. This is how he takes down an elevator full of guards. This is how he gets it all kicked out of him. Just look at how bad he gets beat, but still, still gets up again. And furthermore, I think there's a very clever choice being made by the writers, especially for someone like Captain America. If this one scene was all that existed, then this could so easily be this vanilla, patriotic, nationalistic scene. Because Captain America always fights evil. 
But Steve doesn't just fight for America the whole time. He goes on to discover how S.H.I.E.L.D., an American military branch, is compromised and then actively stands against it. When the UN wants to turn the Avengers into the militarized team, he once again stands against these cruel injustices. Strangely, Captain America does not just stand for America. A likely nod to the fact that Captain America in the comics has become disillusioned with America in the past before, which is why he became Nomad for a bit. Because there's a person underneath. Steve Rogers as a person is someone who stands against evil no matter which form it takes. That's why his thesis begins with I. Is there a past of him being used as blatant propaganda? Yeah, which the film addresses it in a tongue-in-cheek manner. And if you can, check out Just Right's video on it. It's super good and it's what inspired me to make this video. But anyway, this thesis appears two more times. Once against the Red Skull in the same movie, and again against Iron Man in Civil War. And it functions as a perfect thesis in both moments. Because while Steve's goal and motivations have altered, his thesis is still accurate. And that's what makes it so good. It is adaptable and can change while we're still retaining the same core. Against Red Skull, he is surrounded and staring the ultimate evil in all but spits in his face. But more namely against Iron Man, the line focuses less on the large moral quandaries and instead implies on their personal relationship. When Steve mutters this line against Iron Man, he knows he's at his end. And just like before, for all he know, he's about to die. But it doesn't matter. Tony is trying to kill his best friend for a reason that he could not control. And although he understands Tony, Tony is still wrong. And Steve knows this, so he stands against him, showing his inability to compromise on his morals, even for somebody he calls a friend. And from a more abstract manner, I think this line is even more important, especially in the context of this video, because it was born from the MCU. As far as I can tell, or at least my research can tell, this line was not lifted from the comics. This was born at the same time as this iteration of Captain America. So this MCU cap is all the more defined by it. Something unique to this MCU's version of him, that lets him stand apart even from his own comic book. Which is pretty inspiring. The dummy grenade. Just as a personal tangent, I want to say I love Captain America. I saw the first Avenger when I was 14 in high school, and he immediately became my favorite. And I remember being hesitant because of the whole patriotic angle. But I admired the human. I idolized Steve Rogers. In the eight years it's been since that movie came out, each installment he inspired me to be better. To do better. I know a lot of people are saying this, but it's true. Whenever I was down, I'd watch the first Avenger. Just to listen to his speech about not liking bullies, about just being a kid from Brooklyn and about how he can do this all day. He was a huge hero to me and while this is just a prediction from Chris Evans' own reports, I also realized that in a few days, I'm going to have to say goodbye to him. I'm going to have to accept that this hero who I've spent 8 years of my life idolizing is going to leave. And <laughs> in just talking about this, I feel my throat starting to choke up a little bit. Because I don't know what form it'll take, but I know... Something is going to happen. So as just a public thank you to all the people who took part in sculpting Captain America. For creating and crafting the hero that's helped me rise and challenge evil in our own world. Thank you. And thank you for watching this video for so long. It definitely went on longer than the standard video, but I guess I had a lot to say. And if you like this, don't forget to subscribe and share this with your friends. But, you know, until then, that's all I got. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.